Well, we'll just play it by ear. Okay, so we're at DerbyCon and uh, talking to one of the attendees, and your name is? Scott Link. Scott Link, okay. Um, so Scott has, I think, officially watched more uh, talks than any uh, attendee I've seen so far. Um, wait, you, so you saw the, the J Jared Atkinson and Roddy Winchester one? Yep, yep, I saw that one. That one was pretty good. Um, these are a couple of uh, former Air Force guys. Yeah. And um, so they were talking about, it was kind of like um, apply the scientific method to doing a uh, hunt. Okay. You know, it's like, hey, I tests, yes, uh, yep, absolutely. What sure. data do I need to collect? So it was, you know, I like the purposeful part of it, you know, as opposed to, hey, just collect all the data, then you have probably way more than you're ever going to psychically deal with. Yeah. So they said, hey, you know, um, what are some threats? What are th some things that you worry about? And figure out, okay, what does that attack look like? What right. kind of instrumentation do I have in place or do I need to put in place? Yeah. Gather the data, test it, make sure it works, and then adjust the sales oh, after cool. that. So I don't remember exactly what the example was, but the first half, the guy was laying out the methodology and then the second half, a guy did a demo. Oh, it was uh, Kerberos. It was the uh, golden, ticket. Oh, golden ticket. Yeah, right. so they, they showed, you know, hey, how do I look for, like, maybe Mimi Cats, but it wasn't specifically Mimi Cats. It was, hey, I want to know if the golden ticket is, going to, is being used. Yeah. What, what are the, uh, where does that show up in the logs? How do I get that into my sim? How do I get that into my tools that I'm going to analyze for? Yeah. So, what, so I thought that was pretty cool. What were cool. some of the tools they used to actually enable that? Um, they didn't go into a lot of details on that. Um, basically, you're looking in um, Event Viewer, so you're looking in the logs for particular um, event IDs, right. and then when the, in those events, you're looking for particular fields and some things that don't make sense in the fields. So as I'm talking this through, I'm remembering Mimikatz by default um, makes a ticket that's good for 10 years Whereas Windows default, when you get your ticket, it's only good for 10 hours. Okay. So, so that was one of those things where, you know, if somebody's not tweaking their implementation of trying to hack you and just use the defaults from Metasploit then, um, or from Mimikatz, just look for something that's like 10 years or other ridiculous, you know, times. Right. So, so I thought that was pretty cool. Very nice. Okay. And then... Um, mm -hmm. This morning, I saw Zach Brown, Hidden Treasure Detecting Intrusions with ETW, and that one kind of dovetailed with Matt Swan's Defending the Cloud, Lessons from Intrusion Detection in SharePoint Online. Right. And these guys, they both work for Microsoft, mm -hmm. so they have like tens of thousands of servers. And, it, and what's working in their favor is they're pretty homogenous. Yeah. So, you know, it's, so in that regard, I think it makes it pretty easy sure. um, to figure out what normal looks like and then makes it easier to kind of find weird stuff. But um, Matt, one of his points was, hey, don't focus on the events. You know, and he talked through the different approaches that they were trying out as they decided, hey, we need to do this. And uh, he introduced some like, graph theory and some statistical methods that I'm not real familiar with, sure. but you know, it was a lot more interesting, like talking about aggregating, looking for some patterns, and then looking at those, um, like you'd, you'd have a blob, right? And then uh, he was also using ETW, which is, I'm not, I'm gonna blank on what it's called. It's, uh, it comes with Windows. It's been in Windows since 2000, I think is what they said. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Zach Brown, he's written an agent that's available on GitHub that'll run in on Windows 7 or better, or Windows 2008 R2 or better. Okay. And basically, you can write a little agent to pull certain events out of ETW, which was originally put in for debug purposes. Okay. So they're using it to find, you know, hey, I want to know where all my clients are going for DNS, like get all their DNS queries. So... So sometimes, you know, if you talk to the guys who run Windows DNS, they're like, you can't have my logs, they're much too noisy. Yeah. So push comes to shove, maybe you use this to collect it from the client. Right. And then even better, you give it a list to say, hey, I want to know if you're going to these domains. So if you have a list of bad domains, you just feed it out to your agent, and okay. then you get it from there. So nice. it was some fun stuff. So, so this year, do you find that the talks are better or uh, 
they have been in previous years, the same or, or worse? I think it's about the same. I didn't come last year, um, okay. but I was here the year before that and the year before that. And, okay. uh, you know, it's, it seems pretty much the same. Uh, Saturday doesn't se today doesn't seem quite as busy as it was my memory of the last couple of times yeah, I've been here. That, yeah. um, but the rooms, like I try to get into um, the uh, lateral movement and it was full by the time I got there. I, I, I was too slow. There seems like there's a lot of lateral movement talks this year. There's yeah, been there at least yesterday. more. Yeah, yeah, one yesterday, and then there's a lot of uh, like uh, PowerShell stuff. A lot of PowerShell. Yeah, stuff. and I noticed a lot. There was a lot of PowerShell stuff uh, two years ago as well. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I think it's just there's so much Windows out there, and it's it's. I've played with PowerShell some. It's it's pretty slick, um, but I it's. I'm, I'm a Unix guy originally, so making the switch to object-oriented thinking is still not quite there yet. So. Well, yeah, I think two years ago was when uh, Manifestation put out PowerShell Empire. So oh, yeah. That was, that was huge. I remember that talk. The line for that one went all the way around yeah. the around the thing, and that was the, like one of the first uh, PowerShell frameworks. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's and it's um, the Zach Brown talked about using ETW to try to find you know. Um, get past the obfuscation of PowerShell code, and then he had a couple of different event IDs that you could look for that were symptoms of um, PowerShell, like trying to load stuff up, uh, load up DLLs and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so that that was pretty cool. Um, so, what uh, what ones are you looking forward to the rest of the day and uh, Sunday? Um, I think I'm going to try to get into the evasion techniques. I, uh, okay. And That's then, at 1 o'clock. So yeah, so it's it's getting, getting close. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then um, uh, I'm from St. Louis. One of our guys from St. Louis, Michael Collins, has given a, a, talk, a stable talk on drone-delivered attack platform. Um, I saw really? kind of a preview of it. It was... It's pretty interesting. Sort of like a Wi-Fi pineapple, but with a drone. Yeah, yeah. Basically, he oh. used he used like um, you know he he picked out a couple of different he tested a couple of different drones, right, right. you know, looking at payloads, looking at stability, also trying to keep costs really low, and then um, trying to figure out you know what to, to attach to it so that you could you know maybe maybe you come in you know put it on top of a building let it sit for a little while sure. try to get some stuff off the wi-fi network and go off so that makes complete sense yeah, yeah. so it was it was interesting I, I saw a preview of it i think it'll be pretty good um and then i hadn't looked to tomorrow yet i haven't uh i was actually looking forward to maddie stone's talk about uh a reverse d embedded device reversing uh, i met her last night at the bar she seemed like a really nice lady so i thought i'd, I'd go and see hers i gotta leave around two to go to the airport so oh yeah um oh michael goff's also speaking that this is a last minute martin bro he couldn't make it. he got a family emergency so they put uh, michael goff in there so oh, yeah. gonna be, he's gonna be talking about endpoint uh, how endpoints are, uh, you know, not finding things. Oh yeah, and which yeah. Ones, actually, that'd be a good which one. Which ones see. did, you know, better or worse, and so. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of marketing fud, you know, and there's a lot of products that you know you you sit and you look at it and you're like, well, it's catching things. Right. Did it catch all the things? It's nope. it's it's tough to tough to tell. Yeah, so he's un he's under NDA, but uh, he's not naming names. But he's going to be talking about which ones you know didn't find dry decks, for instance. Oh yeah. And you know, so he it's not perfect. Oh, there it goes there he goes. As a matter of fact. So. Yeah. But yeah. But, so um, yeah, that that was uh, one to look forward to. Um, and that actually might go really well with um, I saw <laughs> Win Schwartz's How to Measure Your Security, holding security vendors accountable. Oh yeah, that'd be like the after effect when you find out yeah. your security is crap. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was um, you know building a way to. Um, so he and this other guy are writing a book. I guess it'll be out this fall. So this yeah. is the preview, and um, they're talking about. Um, how do you test your vendors to make sure they're uh, living up to their claims and that sort of thing? So yeah, those two pieces would go together well, I think. Cool. I pretty, oh, you got some swag. Oh yeah. I yeah. had the original fidget cubes off of uh, Kickstarter, so those two. Yeah, Mr. Betcher grabbed a couple of those. Yeah, this was uh, this was being given away by the ISC squared All right. group, so As I saw if, one. You know, studying for your CISP isn't making you fidgety enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I've already got it, so I'm going to give this to my kid, I think. She might awesome. like it. Yeah, they had fidgets, the spinner thing. Yes. Too, so yeah. My daughter's not into those, thankfully. So, yeah. 
Yeah, a couple All of them right. have been out there. Well, well, cool. Thank you for coming on the yeah, show. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Right on. Yeah. Okay, so we got some more audio from DerbyCon, and we're talking to one of our slackers uh, from our Slack channel. Uh, met him for the first time. Is this your first DerbyCon? It's my second, actually. Second. I was here two years ago for DerbyCon 5. Um, Unity? I think it's Unity. Okay, so, you so don't two follow, years ago. You don't have the Star Trek curse where the, the odd ones <laughs> are, are suck and the even ones are good? Fortunately not. Okay, so you had just as much fun at number five as you did at number um, seven? I, so, uh, long story. Uh, number five actually got work to pay for me to go do some training. So I did the Pentest 101 training with oh, uh, Paul Koblitz, Larry, and I always get a surname wrong, Spoon, Spoon, Spoon Man. Anyway. Uh-huh. Uh, and they both work for Dave, um, they're trusted set guys. Um, they did a, it was a two day training, uh, as with everything here, it, it, it's fantastic and incredibly scary. It's like, this is great. I can, oh crap. If I went back to my, th this is where I realized how badly our setup was. Yes. Um, and I'm not going to go specifics, um, when I'm being recorded, but anyway, that was fairly horrible. Um, I'm pretty sure they could have broken in in about three seconds. Well, so they are fairly talented. So yeah. Yes, definitely. So, um, so yeah, we did that, um, and work paid for that, and the hotel and everything, and uh, then I came to see what's going on, and it was my first time, I came to get my badge, so go up the escalator, and there's one of the uh, TV screens, it's a computer basically, and it shows you, you know, what's in the Hyatt and what's nearby, blah blah stuff, and they figured out that if you tap in the top left corner, it brings up... Um, like their version of, of task manager sure. and from there they could get task manager up and they managed to enable the accessibility functions to turn the on-screen keyboard on and from that and task manager they can then run whatever they want so they ran a command prompt and then they so they started off and they loaded up notepad um, and they started saying pwned by the, and, oh, no we can do paint let's do paint so they did paint and then they drew a little because uh, it's touch screen you know pwned up derbycon um, and they got it wrong. It's like Dobicon 12 or something. And he's like, no, wait, that's not right. And they, they fixed Dobicon 5. Um, and then um, someone who, who may or may not um, have a, a name that sounds like uh, Nee Gomes, um, who may or may not work for Microsoft. Um, and he, he ran uh, PowerShell and had it playing. Uh, so it's Rick Astley's never going to give you up but because it's an ASCII he called it Rick ASCII okay and, and there was well there is sound but you didn't see it because they didn't have the sound on the screen and he's a little bit of him dancing in ASCII nice. <laughs> nice. Um, and, and that was like welcome to Derby nice. <laughs> that, that was the first when people started showing up okay. um, and no I just I I love it and I hate it here oh, and I'll explain okay. why I love it because you go and see the talk so I did a talk um, it was MS administrator, and I forget his, uh, John? Yeah. Um, another slacker. He went and did um, securing Windows via group policy. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It's like, oh, yeah, hey, just turn off debug. No one needs it. Maybe a developer. I've been a developer. I never needed debug privileges. I used the IDE with, the, with whatever language. But, you know, turn that off, and that's how a lot of stuff nowadays uses to, to inject into memory and stuff like that. Uh, and that's like, great, fantastic. Because I have no budget. I mean, no one's got a big budget. It's free. It's group policy. Excellent. It's real simple. They've got a GUI. It's just drill down, set like this, this, and this. Turn them off. Done. Real simple. And that's great. And then I hate it because it's like, oh, crap. Now I've got to spend six months setting all this stuff up that I learn. And oh, crap. Anyone could have just do stuff on us. And I really need to do this and secure it. So it, I love it and I hate it here. Which sounds, and, and I, I don't really hate it, yeah. Yeah. but it, it's, it's, yeah, I'm going to spend the next six months trying to implement what I learn over these few days um, and arguing against management and, and all that. Well, yeah, I really do need to spend time doing this. Yeah. Um, well, why? We've never been hacked before. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean we're never going to get hacked and people are getting, the bad guys are getting more and more sophisticated. We need to, to step our game up. So, so Ms. Mr. Zoke, what other talks have you seen other than the, that one? Actually, I, I heard that MS Administrator got a $20 tip from somebody in the uh, audience. Both of them actually came to the pizza meetup that we had for, for BreakSec. Uh, the guy who actually did the tipping 
showed up early and left, and then MS administrator came in after the fact and said, hey, this guy gave me 20 bucks. I was like, yes, he was here. He told me about him. So um, what other talks have uh, have you actually seen uh, while you were here? Um, I'm just trying to because there were a few I wanted to get into, and they were just, the lines were, were crazy. Um, Were they all PowerShell based? Um, yeah, I wanted to go see um, someone called Lee Holmes, who does a, a PowerShell thing that, that completely unrelated to anyone else I may have mentioned earlier. Uh, he does a he did a PowerShell talk. In fact, he's got one. I think in an hour he's doing another one. Um, so I'm going to try and get into that one. Um, like I said, the, the line was around the corner, and then security were just like we're full, you know, fire occupancy max maxed out. Um, so that that's. The, that's also great because Iron Geek records everything. Adrian Crenshaw, mm -hmm. you know, he records everything. You can just Google Iron Geek Derby 2017 in like a week or two. The stuff will start showing up there. So you can. Yeah. So I, I'm, I've got a big list of stuff that I wanted to see. Ones I missed, I couldn't get in. Or two. There's one um, coming up. It's Paul Astorian's in one, and Ben Ten's doing another one. Oh, and I'm pretty sure they're both going to be full. Being double booked sucks. Yeah. yeah. So, but I can watch them later. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get um, in line early enough to get in to see either one of them, mm. but I can watch it later on Iron Geek. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and they were also uh, streaming them in the hotel rooms if you're yeah. in the Hyatt. How was that? Did, are you in I'm the not Hyatt? in the. I'm actually crashed at a friend's house. So oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Derby on the cheap. Right on. Yeah, and I guess you know if you don't have a ticket, you can come and do the lobby con. Which is, is always doable. I mean, you're not going to see any of the talks, but if you had a hotel room or something in the Hyatt or next year in the Marriott, they'll probably stream those to the room. So you could yeah. see the ones you wanted to or switch back and forth between ones you wanted to. Hey, there you go. That's an idea. And even oh, you sit in one and what stream on the other one. Oh, yeah. um, uh, but I don't have unlimited data, unfortunately. That's, uh, that's, um, but they do a live stream as well, so you should be able to turn it on right now onto YouTube and, and live stream them. Yeah. Exactly as you're going, which is great. So, um, and yeah, LobbyCon, a lot of people do. I mean, you've got the, the sort of the inside vendors and the outside vendors. So you can still see a bunch of the vendors and talk to them. The lock picking village was, is still open for everyone. Um, there's still a bunch of that. So, yeah, I know quite a few people that have been lobbyconning it and, and they're having a lot of fun. Well, you say no, no unlimited data, but their hotel Wi Fi is available if you wanted to use the hotel Wi Fi. I'm scared to. <laughs> it, it's a hacker conference. Do I? Re I mean, I came in and, and we all know a couple of weeks ago the whole Bluetooth issue. I'm like walking. Oh, got to turn Bluetooth off. Um, yeah, I just. I mean, it's DerbyCon. It, it is. If I say a nice DefCon or Black Hat, I'm going to get in trouble. But I think it's a different vibe. It's definitely. I mean, it, the idea is it's much more family friendly. I mean, there's there's numerous children here. Yeah. I mean, not tons and tons and tons, yeah. but there I've seen uh, half a dozen mm -hmm. or something. There was a little girl who was working on picking locks. She was trying to climb up on the the bar stool. So actually, the bar stool almost fell over. I caught it, oh my. and so it was. She was climbing up one side and it tilted. So I grabbed it, and her mother sort of looked over and nodded approvingly, kind of thing. It's like, yeah, I got to have a daughter myself. She does the same thing. Yeah. Um, actually, I didn't catch my daughter when she did it. We were around the other side. We just saw the top of the chair tipple over and then screaming. Oh. Oh yeah, um, she's fine. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, yeah, so but she was this little girl was just like trying to pick locks and she wanted to play the pachinko machine and. Oh, that's right. The the locks you got to pick the locks for pachinko balls. Yeah, yeah there's, there's so the fools and I can never remember what it stands for. Fellowship of, of something lock picking something. Um, they're here. Uh, they they were here last. Year. I think they're here every year. They were here last time I was here, uh, and they run around and they they do things they'll do crazy little things sometimes and and this year they they made some pachinko machines and, and like i said you can pick the locks to get the balls to play on the pachinko machines and if you get the tokens from the pachinko machine pachinko is like it, it's like um japanese slot machines Upright kind of thing. Yeah. yeah but it, it's it's a very japanese style which is why it's pachinko yeah. um and then yeah if you get the tokens you can buy more balls as well if you want to keep playing to win and i kept like fidget spinners and stuff i can't remember what they're giving away but the little things they're giving away yeah. So it's some very cool stuff. There's, there's a little bit for everything. I mean, they've got the social engineering village they did, um, the phoning up random companies trying to get information out right. um, yesterday, mm -hmm. um, which I watched some of, and some people had just, ju it was not their fault. They just had a horrible time. They got 20 minutes to do it. Yeah. And one person was trying to get some information from, from Taco Bell. And she, she got 
found out like store numbers and phone numbers for them and she found out oh hey my name's john from from taco bell headquarters we just want to check because of hurricane irma we're trying to do this thing blah 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 can we just confirm this is your store number and this you know this is your manager's name and all that's publicly available but it sounds impressive yeah. oh right yeah, they know who it is um and then but the problem she had is she had one girl that spoke mostly spanish and didn't fully understand they wanted to try and get them to go to a website mm. and she's trying to say the website and the person couldn't figure out what letters they meant to go to right. um and and then someone else hung up on her and then someone else was like i'm sorry i've got someone at the drive through i've got to go serve them uh and she just had a bad time yeah um i thought the cover story was good yeah um hey hurricane irma people want some businesses want to come and run some training um Taco Bell want to offer it to get good PR, blah blah. So it sounded it sounded legitimate because you know when hurricanes and natural disasters hit, people want to help out. It sounded very very genuine. She had store numbers and stuff that would make a bunch of sense. So it really did sound good. But she just unfortunately just had the bad things. And I don't know how I don't know exactly what she needed. Um, she tried to get someone going to the website and it was blocked at their location. They couldn't on oh. the, wow. so th yeah, they, they okay. blocked. Uh, it was it was one of the social engineering websites, S E O R G dot O R G, yeah, which like confuses people. That was yeah, that was a big, that was a big yeah, point. but they were blocked. Everyone was blocked. Yeah. <laughs> she tried like four different store locations, oh. and then someone's like, it's someone at drive through. Can you give me a call back in two minutes? That was like four minutes before the time was up, so she just got to calling her back, and they answered. Mm -hmm. and then people weren't answering, and, and so I thought she did really well. I'm just I don't know how many points she got in the end because I, I didn't I don't know the, the scoring sheet, but she it was not her fault, and that's that's the way it works sometimes. Yeah. But they so yeah they did pass the polygraph test now. Um, I mean it's just a little bit of everything. It's fantastic. Right. I wonder if somebody from the Taco Bell security team was at either defcon or DerbyCon. they're like oh no quick we gotta block this site <laughs> i i no i i mean i know um so i work in education and i'll leave it nice and vague like that we have just a big list of stuff to block oh right like a blacklist uh, or a dns black hole kind of thing yeah and it's based off of I don't know, some some available list through the firewall or whatever yeah cool. um and and every now and then there's one you try and uh, what was it Imager, I think it was, mm -hmm. and it was blocked for pornography. Was, well, wow. I guess if anyone can upload their own pictures, maybe, but it just seemed a bit, yeah, it's a bit strict sometimes, but fortunately, I know the network admin, and I'm like, oh, yeah. can you just release this one, please? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this one, I need this one site. So are you going to come back next year? I'm going to try and come back next year. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm in discussions with the boss about it, okay. um, as in my wife. Well, you know, if you just want a ticket, you wouldn't have to pay the 175 bucks to come. Like, you know, we, we auctioned ours off. So if you yeah. could just win one of those, I'd be better off. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I mean, we'll see. But the, the talking about, you know, the wife and I come in making sort of a mini weekend. Of course, the problem with, with uh, she will be, uh, well, she's three, almost four. She should be four, almost five next okay. year. That's beginning to get to the age where she might start getting some, some stuff out of it. She'll probably enjoy playing around with the lots of stuff. Yeah. So... Well, you could sit her down in front of a command prompt and ha have her hack, uh, you know, wireless routers or something. Well, I figure what I would do is I just sit her down and see if she can enter the CTF, and because uh, you know I do want a black badge, yeah. and that would be very cool. Oh, she could get you a black badge. She'd be your favorite child in forever. So, uh, well, uh, okay. So technically, she's my only biological child. So she is. Cool. She doesn't have to know that. <laughs> yeah. But cool. But yeah, so it's it's no. I just it it's fantastic. Um, it's not the whole scary. Oh my God! I'm going to get hacked just by walking in the building. Vibe. It's a, it's a very family friendly. I mean, Dave's running around, um, and Dave loves giving hugs. Have you had a hug? Your hug from him yet? I, I got hugged and handshaked uh, earlier in the week when I took training with Fuzzy Knob. So yeah, when it was when it was a lot less people here, I yeah. got my awkward hug with Dave. So that was excellent. Well, it was funny. So I got one hug from him uh, Thursday night, and I was talking to I think his wife was working on the selling the t-shirts, and I grabbed one of the t-shirts. Um, I, uh, actually, I grabbed two, one of the smallest ones for my daughter, but it, it's, it's still going to be a big on her. Mm. And uh, I mentioned to you, hi, I've got to you know, buy a T-shirt from Derby. Visit, um, say hi to, to Paul and, and Larry for the training, so I like to say hi to them. Yeah, Say hi to Ben 10, the home sub, tick, tick, tick. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, get a hug from Dave's on my list. And I turned around, he's right there, and he said, you can have another one, buddy, and gives me another nice. hug. <laughs> 
So yeah, so now I'm going for a one hug from Dave every day. Oh. And I already got one from today, so I just have to grab one for tomorrow and then I'm done. Then nice. I have four days, four, right. four hugs. Oh, oh and I got the, the uh, virtual hug on the t-shirt. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. It's, it's a picture of Dave and his arms. Are, I'm like, like you can see me raising my arms. So <laughs> he's got his arms outstretched on the T-shirt, and it's like uh, come in for a hug or something. Nice. It says like binary defense on the back, but oh, cool. it was just yeah, virtual hug. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Zoke, for coming on the show. Hey, no problem, Ryan. Thank you for doing the show. Okay, that was it. That's it so far. It's full. Cool. All right. So getting some more audio from uh, DerbyCon. We are with the Fools, who are running the Lockpick Village. So if you could introduce yourselves to the world. Hey, I'm Dossman. I'm Zach. Dossman and Zach. Okay. So how long have you guys been putting this on? We've been doing the DerbyCon lockpick Lockpicking Village since number one. So <laughs> Seven years so far. Really? Okay. Um, are you guys local to the area or do you travel? Uh, we're from Bloomington, Indiana, or some of us are, not all of us, but our, our most central crew is in Bloomington. Yeah, and um, you know, we, we set up at places like DerbyCon, and we bring people from all over the place, so there's, a, there's fools generally everywhere. Okay, awesome. So, so there's no, there's no uh, dress code, but when I saw Nathan... Zach. Oh, it was close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some A's in there. <laughs> Sorry, Zach. Um, you got the whole Brian Setzer thing going on, oh, yeah. which is very cool, very, uh, very nice, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta be well dressed. And so, like, my, my whole stick is I'm the sales guy in the lockpicking village. Right. And okay. so, that's, I've been doing that since the first Derby Con, like, okay. just being the sleaze bag that's selling, like, the lockpicks. Okay. Because you, you, got, you had to use, you, yeah, you no, know, no, you like, you, who, too, who are so. you gonna trust to buy lockpicks from? Like, are they, are stuff. they good? Will yeah. they get me into it? Yes they will like yeah and so like i can believably tell you they work i also thought maybe i was selling my soul to satan or so he's like yes welcome (laughs) to the lockpick village i already got 50s devil today so like i came down and she's like she's like you look like the devil from the 50s i'm like yes (laughs) that's awesome okay so um what was the what was the idea how did fools get started did it predate derby comp yeah uh we started uh in 2006 um, we just wanted to have a local lockpicking club, and I saw some of the other groups that existed at the time. And some of them were not really accepting memberships and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, well, I want a flag to put up. So Fraternal Order of Locksport, uh, we ended up landed on for a name, and yeah. It kept big sort of big going strong, and we informally were a group uh, before Fools, yeah. uh, ma- you know, making our own picks and stuff like that, and just yeah. kind of like hanging out, picking locks. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's... You know, that's an act that's pretty pervasive in the hacker community anyways. It's been there forever. Right. Um, you know, but uh, so we were just thought, how can we take take this farther? Cool. Yeah, so there's there's a number of different, and there's actually local lock sports in there. Seattle's got one. Um, and then there's the, the other one that doesn't, that rhymes with fools, but it's like. Tool, probably. Okay, the open yeah. organization of lock sport. <laughs> I didn't know if y'all were like in some kind of competition with them or not, so I didn't want to mention their name, but that's cool. Right. Oh, yeah, we're just, we're friendly competition. We're all yeah. friends. It's a small community, but, you know. Yeah, he says it's friendly. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Frenemies? Are, you, are, you, are y'all yeah. frenemies? Yeah, there we go. That's yeah. what, no. <laughs> Love to hate? We're, we're, yeah. we're good. We're, we're no. you know, again, it's a small community, so, I mean, we're all friends. Yeah. <laughs> so have the tools changed at all since you guys started? I mean, Lock sport, um, lock sport's been around for a while. I'd Is say that to me, on? like from my perspective, the gimmicks have changed. So, at, yeah, so like as like all the villagers gotten, the villages have gotten bigger, the conferences have gotten bigger, a lot of pressure to have, more variety, things um, like that. When it comes to picking locks, you really only need a rake and a tension wrench and maybe like your favorite hook pick or something like that. That, to me, that's what it takes. Um, it's good to have a tool for every occasion. There, there are things like the, the, uh, the tensioners with the, the teeth on them and stuff, yeah. and that's kind of like it's, it's been around for a while, but it's become more popular and right. and other yeah, things like, I, the, I, like the snowman pick and things like that, like the ball picks for like picking both sides of a wafer lock, and then you got like the snowman yeah. and things like that, yeah. and they and they do serve a purpose. Like there are just some weird locks out there, um, and so. I mean, I see a lot of cha- lot, a lot more creative design in the last five years. Um, okay, so depending on where you live, having lock picks can be considered uh, a crime, right? Is, is that still the case in most states and, and or countries? Not most states. There are some states where you you 
need to be a licensed locksmith uh, to to have picks, and they make it a, a crime or, or of some sort to to have them. Uh, a lot of that's driven by industry to protect locksmiths, the, the locksmithing uh, association Aloha. So a lot of legis legislation reads it identically, and that helps local established locksmiths keep out you know these uh, drill out shops that come by and stuff. So really, the intent is to protect the locksmiths and keep their you know. It, it, help help them, you know, uh, uh, restrict who can be involved. But yeah, some states do are a little heavy-handed in the laws, uh, like Tennessee and other places uh, where it's you know it's a felony. It, just possession of picks is a felony. Most states, though, most states and countries, uh, possession does not equal intent. Now, if you're committing a crime and you have picks on you, sure they're burglar tools. Otherwise, they're just tools, and there's nothing wrong with it. You so know? It, it's like having Metasploit on a VM. It's it's not a tool unless you're actually using it to break into something. Correct, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on through. It's all good. So, um, how would, can, can people join? Can people join Fools? Um, we're, people can join. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're yeah. really a, a, just a close-knit group of uh, friends, uh, and we've got a lot of friends in a lot of places. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> Anybody... Anybody with the, the desire or half a notion that they want to be associated with us, um, you know, more power to you. Come on and stand with us. And, yeah, and that's, that's great. So when I say anybody can be a fool, anyone is. <laughs> so you guys had you said the gimmicks. So, I mean, not just with the, the, the lock picks, but there's, like, gimmick locks as well? There's a lot of bypass tools that are starting to show up now, like uh, some, I forget what the name escapes me. Uh, there's, there's some tools for the, the the master lock and stuff that are very specific to, to that I mean technically there have been there have always been bypass tools but some new stuff's been showing up from time to time and, and if you just want to like you know like a, an example a lot of people have a lot of success with them so it's not like a gimmick because it doesn't work but like a pick gun um, a pick guns great it's you know a, a average pick guns what 30 bucks yeah. um, you know it's thirty dollars what you can do with two picks, uh, really, and I mean it's it's fun. It looks impressive in a case, you know. It makes really loud, snappy noises. But when it comes down to it, you you can do the same thing with a pick for a lot less money. I mean, I guess it would be different if this were, you know, if, if everybody were buying these things because that's their job, and you know, and and everything has a practical purpose. This is a hobby. It's fun, so you know, I I get it. But for the most part, and then there's a lot of cheap crap that gets flooded into the market. And so there's good pick guns out there, um, but we you get you get all these that are you know overdone, but they're doing the same old thing. The sixty dollar pick gun is the same. It's going to work exactly the same as a seven dollar pick gun from China. So why spend the extra money if it's <laughs> not going to work that much better? So. Yeah, but I mean, with a pick gun, I can can't. Does that lower the bar for people who are picking locks? Does it make it easier to pick locks, or is it just more cool and Hollywood like? It's more cool and Hollywood like, and hey, you know, it's fun to have one. Hey, I'll, I'll admit, it's fun to have one to try it out, but it takes a little bit of practice. But the application, it applies to a lot fewer locks than what you can use it a uh, set of picks for. Okay. So, so bump keys, are they still very useful? Do you guys still have them along with your lock picks? Yeah, uh, you know, and I think much to, like, engineers and, like, industry leaders chagrin, uh, bump, bumping works, and it works on a lot of things. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, with a key and a hammer, and, and anybody that comes into our village and sees our hammer, I mean, it, it shows you it doesn't take much to bump a lock. Uh, and, yeah, it works. It, it, it works. It still works on a lot of new stuff. And you just got to get the, the feel and the technique down, and you have no problem. Another thing, again, you can pick a cheap lock open. So if it bumps open, that's no big surprise. But the problem with bumping is it, it still applies to a lot of high security locks that should not open as easily. Okay. Um, so that's what bumping is still a relevant thing and still very you know, good to keep aware of and, and keep up with what's going on there. Would, would, people, would you argue that an oxyacetylene torch is a much more effective lock pick? It depends. Uh, on a safe, you're going to burn up everything inside. Right, right. Um, a set of picks will keep, if you're after paperwork, you know, then it'll keep it intact. If you're just after precious metals, uh, then sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Because I always say my 100% is, uh, is a lock uh, bolt cutters or something, you know, but um, why, why do I not have the patience to lock pick? Is there something I'm doing wrong? 
Um, not turning your brain off. And so, like, I'll have people that just stand there, you know, and, and kudos to them for having the patience to be there an hour. Um, <laughs> but they're sitting there thinking about picking the lock, and they're not listening to me tell them stupid stories. Right. And so I have to tell them the same thing. Look, pay attention to the stupid story, and you're going to open the lock. And so then I'll tell them something about when I was a kid, and then all of a sudden the lock will pop open. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's really, if you're focused too much on it, you're going to overtension. You're gonna push the pins up too hard. You're gonna go a little too far into the lock and you're not gonna be doing anything with your time. Um, you turn, you know, watch the technique a couple times, just copy me, rest on the, on the tensioner and just turn your brain off and just rake. Eventually, you're gonna feel the tensioner give. Um, you know, thinking about it's going to cause problems. That defocusing is critical. <laughs> So you guys, you guys mentioned the tension bar. I think that's my biggest problem is I probably put too much tension on it. How much, I mean, it, do you have like a quantifiable amount or is it just like, oh, it just takes time to learn that? You, you could be quantified, um, maybe a few grams or something. I've never taken the time to do it, but you could put some weights on it, uh, you know, and figure out exactly how much. But it's going to vary from lock to lock, uh, even in the same series of locks. So the ball. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so what's the the most unique or hardest lock you guys have in the uh, in the lab here? Oh, I don't know. Probably the uh, the Folger Adams, right? Um, those are good. Um, I, I've got a reasonable lock collection um, of all the stuff I've got. I mean, probably the Protect Two is is the most advanced, but I've got a lot of interesting other stuff. Uh, I mean, there's tools for opening the Gemini lock protector um, and. The Protect 2 might be the most advanced thing I've got, but there, there's lots of really wild locks out there besides that. What, what makes it so difficult? Is it the pin count, or is it the, the little mechanisms to make it unpickable, quote-unquote? It's, it's a disc detainer lock, so there's no pins. Um, oh. the, the, there's discs that rotate. And this is, it's, it's, the mechanism has been around for a long time, you know, around the century mark or, or longer. There's different companies that make different versions, but their version there is one of the original, and it's uh, just a quality-made lock. The latest version of it has some features that makes it very, very difficult, even if you have a disc detainer pick tool um, to, to open. That will, pra practically speaking, impossible. Um, I'm guessing I won't find this at my local Walmart. Not likely. Um, yeah. How much do those things run? Um, uh, you can get a small padlock for 80, 100 bucks or something, um, and get them in a deadbolt for 120, 150. Um, I, I'm not paid by, by anyone, but if you're looking to get something like that, uh, security snobs, uh, carries uh, equipment and does repinning and key cutting and stuff for that, some of that kind of stuff. But. When you get into that price point and you're really looking at a high security lock, you go, you know, find a place they can register, you know, your identity with the lock, and you can order keys and things like that um, through them. You know, so so yeah, you're paying a, a much premium for for a lot of these things, but at the same time, you do have the peace of mind of knowing that you can call someone if you lose a key or you need more, and one just shows up, and and, and nobody's really having to screw with anything. Sorry about that. So it's convenience and security. All right. So is shimming still a thing? Can you still shim your master locks, or have they gotten actually better at those? Um, I mean, just like master padlocks, sure, they can still be shimmed. Uh, the master combo locks, uh, they can still be shimmed, but at least they, they've started trying to make it a little harder, uh, and they advertise these as anti-shim. Yeah. It's possible, but it, it is a little harder with just a Coke can. Um, but, eh, but it's not like that that's their new standard either. That, yeah. That's just another lock that people have requested. Like the Old Faithfuls are probably never going to go away because they, they offer the, the nice illusion of something being secure. Yeah. And, and for most people that don't have the patience or, or the drive to get into something if it's locked, um, then it serves its purpose. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, well, I mean, the cheaper locks, I mean, 95% of the people, if you're going to a gym, probably won't have, you know, lock picks on them. So, I mean, it really goes to your, your threat model, right? What, you know, if you're worried about people picking and getting into your gym locker and grabbing your, your underwear or whatever, then that, you might want to use the $1,800 lock. Yeah. Whereas the simple, you know, master lock, blue, you know, with like some really simple key is probably going to be enough for you, right? Yeah, yeah. Applying the right lock for the right threat model is exactly correct. So, so I mean, do they, they still measure, like, locks the same the way they do safes with how long it takes to get in, or uh, is, there, is there a way to quantify that? You can come on through. 
Um, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of a UL standard or something for locks the way they do with safe dials. But yeah, the, the UL uh, rating method for, for safe dials, group three, two, and one, is a really good way to look at it, you know, like anything. Like, how long does it take to get through? And I, I'm not aware of that being of anyone applying a system like that towards just ordinary pin tumbler locks or something. Okay. Um, but that, I think that'd be a great idea if the industry would do something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, arguably, your eighty to hundred dollar lock is going to be better than the the three pin master lock you've got in there, obviously. Yeah, and the other thing, if you spend eighty to hundred dollars on lock, even let's say it's a lock, a high security lock that has a known exploit, like someone's discovered it's bumpable in some configurations, you're still going to have more than likely anti drill pins and other features, and it's still going to be a quality made lock. So, but the, the extra hard you know hard, hardened inserts and things like that to make it more difficult to drill out, because that's still the more likely threat scenario. Uh, of something like that is getting busted you know, or brute forced. Uh, Fantastic. Okay. So, you guys sell lock picks, you sell bump keys. What all do you sell here? And, and you know, what, what are the prices like for a set of lock picks that are decent lock picks? Because obviously there's cheap ass lock picks and good lock picks. Yeah. Well, like, so our basic set uh, is a five piece set and has a tutorial with it, and it's $20. Okay. Um, we sell bump hammers and keys. I, I can't remember now. The hammer's, what, $10? Yeah. And uh, the keys are another 10 we're talking about 16-pound slag or drill or something. What are we talking? Oh, we're a super lightweight, flexible hammer. The plastic, the handle is plastic, and then the head of it's wood, okay. um, and it's cut specifically for the right amount of spring to hit that bump key and get it open. Easily concealed. Oh, I mean, um, you, you know what? Probably, probably shouldn't say that. No. No, no. <laughs> it's it's not the easiest thing to conceal, but really, um, you're not going to be per, like you're not going to be perceived as a threat with this thing. Like they're going to look at it and just be like, I wonder what that's for. You know. And, and, and it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Okay. Or it might draw some attention. I don't know. I mean, it, it's a 50-50. As soon as you pull those things out, even here with people that have seen bump hammers before, you pull one of ours out and everybody's like, you know, what do you do with that? Like, yeah. you know, these are guys that probably have bump hammers in a bag somewhere. Yeah. Um, okay. But, yeah. So, oh, I'm just going to say we, we had diversified a little bit this year. Uh, same kind of trying to figure out what people really wanted in pick sets. I mean, we've always provided our basic set and then our premium set uh, with a bigger case, zipper case. But we've also got a couple of more traditional, like flat, slim pick sets this year as well. So, I can't help but notice your awesome badges. Where did you all get those? Ah, I uh, Thankfully, you know, we've got a, a hacker space that we helped start. Uh, and having access to a laser makes life so much more fun. <laughs> so, oh, okay, so it's uh, a laser, uh, laser print. Yeah, well, la laser cut and etched, and I, I make up badges for our crew, so we stand out. Because you got to have bling at a con. And, and badge. <laughs> yeah, I saw Mr. Mr. Meat Shield had one of those. And I, I didn't know what he, where he got that. So, <laughs> so that's awesome. Okay. Right on. So, uh, DOS Man and... Zach. Barber? Fart barber. <laughs> Fart barber. Yeah, that's my actual handle. <laughs> Thanks. Now, now you. Did you lose a bet? Uh, oh, Did no, you? No, that's it. But now, now. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, now you tied me to the name. Fart barber. On, on, on the mic. Okay. Yeah, no. In Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that's your Twitter handle? Uh, um, yeah, it's a handle. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, right on. Yeah, um, I'm not responsible. For what shows up in image search? He lost a bet. He lost a bet, right? He lost a bet. He, he, he took that and ran with it. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know. It was a, I have years without a fit handle. Like, I went by several different things. Like, Sector Molester didn't stick. Oh. You know, Captain Commodore didn't stick. Like, you know, okay. yeah, yeah, you go through the. Yeah, and so, so I say Fart Barber one time, and everyone's like, yeah. So, you know, and, and you know, honestly, I'm not, a, I'm not really an offensive guy. So, so, like, that's, uh, oh, don't laugh like I just lied. <laughs> I'm generally a decent guy, so, like, Fart Barber is really kind of ironic for right. me. Yeah. yeah. So when you're not doing fools, what's your day job? Oh, I am a manager for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I run a small health consultancy on the side as well, so okay. I'm an anthropathic doctor. That's what my degree is in. Right um, and so I, I offer consultancy from anywhere from, like, just vitamin and mineral, like, um, it's like supplemental suggestions on into, like, th like device-driven therapy sessions. So e -STEM, ultrasonic, uh, like, fat loss. Um, I got a facelift machine. Like, I can do a little bit of everything. Wow. And uh, okay. I've got a nice, 
I've got nice capabilities for cool. it. So. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a sysadmin at a Big Ten university uh, in storage, so I deal with petabytes of data, but not pedophiles. Nice. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> so. Very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, if you um, uh, come, you're going to be here next year, hopefully. So, yeah, come on down to Lockpick Village. Uh, can they can they find you guys online if they wanted to buy some stuff from Fools? Yes, uh, BloomingtonFools.org. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is Brian. We're here with some more people. Uh, we actually got the winner of our CTF contest, and she got a ticket to uh, DerbyCon. Miss Winters here. Hi, everybody. And uh, Matt Miller, who he was on our show with about uh, degrees and certs. Yes. Hello. Did you speak? No, I did not speak, not this, speak year. this year. No. Okay, but do you have some kind of connection with DerbyCon this year, right? Yes, I do. So I put together a bunch of reverse engineering challenges for the CTF. And, and you told me that the, you said that they don't, they were hard, but they were still solvable. Yeah, so we, we, uh, I checked in and some of them did get solved already, so they solved some of the easier ones. But I put a gamut of them, and so some of them are more difficult than others. Some you have to run through debuggers and, and things like that. So we did an x86, we did an x64, and then we did some ARM ones on Raspberry Pis. So um, the CTF is over by the time this goes to, to audio. So what kind of tools would they have needed to solve these? Well, you would want to have some sort of disassembler. So a lot of people like IDA because it is really good and works really well. It is prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. So, you know, some of the other disassemblers that you can use would include um, Binary Ninja, Hopper, or you could use like Radar, okay. which is open source, or just even the regular disassemblers. So I didn't, we didn't do any that, that messed up the disassembly necessarily, but we made some, for example, my hard arm one was ROP based. And so you have to go through and decode it and you don't ever see the string in memory. It's all built and moved into a register. And so, you know, it was, it was a little bit difficult for those people who've never done this. And a lot of people who, uh, um, attend DerbyCon or not necessarily reverse engineering people, so it's not up their alley necessarily. So do you guys, do you know if DerbyCon publishes the solutions to this uh, when they're done? Or? As far as I know, they don't, but, you know, me and my friend Josh, we host a, a RE contest, which is just all reverse engineering, um, that uh, happens at the same time as DakotaCon, which is uh, in Madison, South Dakota. And so we host it there, and then anybody can do these challenges. And ours is the points are based on uh, how much time is left in the contest. So the people who solve them more quickly earn more points for them than the people who solve them later. So, and then we scale up the, the amount of points so it makes it more you know, difficult. You get more points for the more difficult ones. So if you were at the DerbyCon CTF and did these challenges, would we see those again at the other place you were at, you're going to you would see similar ones yes yeah we will take and you know we'll reuse some we'll rewrite new ones um, add new features you know we keep a uh, or a private repo of them so that way we can go in the past and look and pull out chunks and rewrite them and you know sometimes they'll uh, you'll accidentally leave some strings in there and somebody will just dump strings and find your whole solution which is not cool from my perspective right <laughs> they seem to like it so very cool. Okay. So speaking of people who do CTFs, um, now this was the second year we did this. Did you, did you do it last year? No, I didn't do it last year. Okay. So was our CTF easy? Well, it was easy for me. I don't want to necessarily say it was easy for everybody, but that's just because it happened to be in my wheelhouse of puzzles. Was there a challenge at all? Um, not... Well, okay. Uh, okay, I'll go with no, not. I heard no, not, not, no. Well, the trinary part was actually a little bit of a brain twister. And that was Tyler's. Tyler actually had that part. I actually liked it. And so what it was was it was a video of Three's Company. And what it was was after about 50 seconds or so, there was a, a, a zero one two 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 one two zero one one two zero two. It was trinary uh, system. So instead of binary, it was trinary. So it had one, zero ones and twos. And uh, 
he was like, oh yeah, you could just you figure that out eventually. I don't think he needed the Three's Company reference, but people seem to like the theme song better. He's like, we actually had somebody email us and go, Three's Company, what do I win? I'm like, that, that's not the answer. So, so you had enough patience to listen to the whole thing, right? Oh, I was totally singing along as I was solving it. Okay. <laughs> it was great. So how did you find the, the OSINT stuff? Um, that I will give thanks to my fellow uh, competitors for helping me out on the third one. Uh, I just did a lot of Googling. Google is your friend. Google dorking especially is your friend. And uh, I've been around LinkedIn for a little while as well. And actually, one of the pages was taken down by LinkedIn temporarily, which is why I didn't get the third flag immediately. So thanks, LinkedIn. But yeah, all credit to my, uh, my fellow competitors for giving me a leg up on that one. Yeah, we only needed really one flag from that one. Um, Miss Amanda did say that the, uh, the machine language uh, at uh, LinkedIn is better at finding fakes than Facebook, or no, at Facebook was better than the one at LinkedIn because all the profiles she put up for Facebook got deleted or shut down. The LinkedIn ones were the ones that stayed up longest. So I don't know if that's, uh, you know, a kudos to either one of those teams. But, uh, yeah, I don't use LinkedIn, which is ironic. So um, what kind of – so do you only do uh, – Matt, do you only do reverse engineering challenges? Or did you – have you ever – do you do OSINT or, you know, encoding or encryption ones? Well, we, we – uh, in the future, we're planning on doing some encryption ones. Um, encoding is always interesting to, to do. You know, trinary is – is is a, is a different one. So yeah, that's a that's pretty neat. So So um how this is your first DerbyCon? Second. Second. Yep. I was here last year. Okay, that's right. I didn't know her then. I stood in line over there and asked her that same question earlier and she's like, "Yeah, this is my second one." I was like, "I'm sorry, I didn't know you then." So, you're a slacker though. You're on our Slack. Yes, I am a slacker. We, we, uh, I interviewed uh, Mr. Zoke uh, either before or after this. I don't know where I put his interview in the audio. So um, what kind of talks have you seen so far? Uh, so far, I've mostly focused on very blue teamy type talks, the malware reverse engineering type talks, and uh, how to better use the red team to enhance your uh, blue team. Okay. Same with questions to Matt. Oh, I've seen both. I, I like, I enjoy going and seeing some of the red team stuff and seeing some of the the new techniques that they come out with um, to evade some of the, you know, new defenses that they put up, um, you know, and I'm always looking at it from a teaching perspective because, you know, trying to offer a cybersecurity degree, we're trying to find those both of those things, both red team and blue team. So, all of the talks are good, and I'm going to be watching lots of videos on the ride home and afterwards just to catch up on those. So the this the cybersecurity degree, where are you teaching that at? University of Nebraska at Kearney, and it, it should be October-ish, it will be finalized, so we'll start offering it here. Is it just, is it, is it an ass in a seat, or can you do it remotely? We don't have it remotely yet, but that is certainly something that will be discussed. Um, right now, we're trying to, we got a curriculum set, and of course, we're probably going to change it next year to add new classes, like offensive and defensive um, classes, so I think... We've got a lot of future in front of us, but it's exciting. Okay, so if somebody wanted to, so if somebody wanted to do the cybersecurity course there, what's the cost involved with that, and what's the prerequisites to to to, to doing that? Well, it's a normal degree for us, so I, I can't tell you the exact amount uh, for the tuition at UNK, but it's cheaper than a lot of other places. We're in the Midwest, and so uh, our costs are a lot less than if you go to even some of the bigger institutions per credit hour, so. But you had to have, like, associates from accredited university. Well, you can come in without any, right? So we're, we're a undergraduate university, so you can come in high school degree and, really? yeah, yeah, okay. and come in and start working on it, so. You have to get an ACT of, like, 25 or something? I think the minimum is 18 or something, but. Hey, I think I could almost get that. All right. Um, so, so there's no there's no other requirements just high school high school degree. Yeah, you just got to take the ACT and right on and stuff like that. So. Awesome. Okay. So, so Ms. Winter, um, where do you hail from? I'm from Dallas in Texas. Oh, so you only have one flight. I have two. I got to go to Dallas and then back to Seattle. So, um, what other cons do you go to? Uh, I also do B sides in DFW. They have a really solid program out there. 
Did you ever go down to Austin and go to like B-Sides Austin or anything like that? The DFIR conference for Sands? I haven't yet, but that's actually on my bucket list next year is to go to B-Sides Austin. Fantastic. Um, so I know where M Matt works at. Uh, do you, can you tell me where you work at? Sorry, I'm not going to disclose that. Is it a three-letter agency? You can tell me. Well, it, it, if you say three-letter agency, I promise not to ask anymore. Well, if I said three letters, it would be NYB, none your business. Oh, gods, that's harsh. That's harsh. Okay, so if you can't tell me where you work, can you tell me what you do? I am a cybersecurity analyst. Like at a SOC or something? I am a blue teamer, yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so uh, do, do, you, uh, do you go to college? Uh, not anymore. I have been through college twice, so maybe third time's the charm. Okay. Well, you know, there's a guy over here with a cybersecurity uh, degree. You just got to go to Nebraska for it. How long is the college degree? Four, three years? Four years, well, yeah. It's a four-year degree. Yep. Okay. You, can, you can do it in about three and a half or three if you got all of your um, general education out of the way. So. Are, are you the instructor for the entire course, or you have like a cadre, a cadre oh, yeah, of people? Yeah, we have a group of professors that teach. And, and our cybersecurity degree is about 50% computer science and about 50% networking. So we try and give them a broad uh, scope of, of things that they need to learn, and we teach them a lot of low-level things, like I teach assembly, which I, I sent you some of my videos for. Right? So, so we teach them the low-level, we teach them a little bit of high-level, and send them off into the world. Yeah, I saw some of those videos you sent me after we did that class. Some of your cl students are punks, man. I mean, they're paying tons of money to go to these things, you know? And they're like, you're like, so how do we do this? <laughs> okay, guys, yeah, this is how we, I'm like, come on, you punks, just figure it out. So, do you, so do you do reverse engineering this winter? I am a reverse engineering enthusiast, is what I call myself. I am uh, still learning, still in the early stages of trying to get good. What, what, what tools do you like to use? Uh, I actually do a lot of static analysis, so I'll use things like PE Studio. I use Ollie Debug. Okay. I use a uh, WinDebug. And uh, I, I do admit to using strings. I'm sorry. I use strings? What's the problem with that? Here's some people don't like people doing that to their challenges. <laughs> wow. Was that my challenge that you did strings on? <laughs> oh, wait. Wait. What's the what, what, what? Because people would just run strings on one of his challenges and just dump all the answers out instead of having to run it through a debugger. Oh, so that's, that's cheating. Yeah, she, she doesn't like my... Uh, my version of cheating. I use strings. I, actually, that was how I, I, I did the Bandit War game on Over the Wire. And it was like, oh, yeah, you got to look this up. And it's like, oh, yeah, if you just run strings on this, it comes up with the password value. I'm like, score. That was reverse engineering. Well, apparently it's, it's Cheater's Hotel over there, I guess. So, All right. So um, what talks are you guys looking forward to? I will be watching almost everything on YouTube because I hear that John Strand's keynote which I unfortunately missed, was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually a panel going on right now about lateral movement that I would honestly enjoy seeing as well. There was a lot of lateral movement talks. Did you guys notice that? There was this year. Yeah. A lot of PowerShell and a lot of talks about how to do the, the lateral and the movements. Well, this is DerbyCon. There's always a lot of PowerShell. That is true. That's the home of PowerShell Empire. So um, same question, Mr. Miller. Well, I did see the John Strand talk, and it was it was rather good. So, okay. I like her. I'm gonna. I'll be watching a lot of YouTube. Yeah. I really like Tyler Hudak's talk. It was the awesomest talk all day. Oh, hey, Tyler. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm not doing too bad. This is Miss Winter. Miss Winter. They've been y'all. They all been wanting to talk quite a bit today. So, um, I'll get with you later about audio if that's okay. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, it was a kick-ass talk, though. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that's Tyler Hudak. We've had him on uh, the show a few times. So, um, um, yeah, that was it for, um, yeah, that was it for, Dur oh, yeah, uh, Miss Winter is being congratulated by Tyler because she solved his challenge. He's the three, uh, three company challenge. So that was fantastic. So um, that was, that's it for this. So uh, listen on for more. Okay, so we're here at DerbyCon. This is the last audio I've got. I literally have less than an hour to go before the uh, airport trip. So um, last person I got to talk to and probably one of the more important people I've had on the show, uh, Joe Gray. Welcome. 
Hey, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for the bold face lie about one of the most important people being on the show. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we did this uh, just before the uh, closing ceremonies of DerbyCon, and it was... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it's going to be very interesting for those of you who went to the closing ceremonies. I won't be there for that. So um, tell us what you did at DerbyCon. I lobby conned really hard. Uh, I made it to one talk. Uh, Maddie Stone's um, Ida, Cor um, Ida with Python. Um, she's one of my mentors for reverse engineering. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, she's on Twitter at Maddie, M-A-D-D-I-E Stone. Um, you know, I had to make it to that, but uh, the brunt of my time here that was not LobbyCon or uh, that talk was uh, the SC Village, Social Engineering Village. Um, I competed in my first Social Engineering Capture the Flag this year, and uh, I'm going to say with good authority, based on some uh, somewhat open source intelligence I received yesterday, uh, since this episode will air after uh, the closing ceremony, um, I won. Okay, I didn't want to say that before the audio. I wanted you to confirm that. Uh, yeah, you told me, like, before, but, yeah, that's, that's cool. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so we had Robert Sell on, who got third place at the CTF uh, in Dirt at DEF CON. So what did you do to prepare for the SECTF? Well, the first thing I did was actually listen to that episode. <laughs> um, but in terms of preparation... <clears throat> I had already read Michael Basil's open source intelligence technique books. I've already read all of Christopher Hadnagy's book, uh, books. I've read up on Dr. Cialdini. I've got formal research at the PhD level uh, in applied psychology and social engineering when I was working on the PhD in IT that I never finished because social engineering was my dissertation topic. And if I ever resume, it probably still will be. Uh, with that, though, once I was assigned my target, I just I found out the scope. I asked my questions. and. I saw it and destroyed yeah. in a non-destructive manner, if there is such a thing. Yeah. So you, you've got all the training and stuff, but the one I saw, which was the very last one of the day, poor bastard, it's like almost 5 o'clock in the evening. He's trying to get people on a Friday to give him some answers and stuff. He did fairly decently, but it seems like a lot of this is just, you know, throw the bones and hope that you hit 7 and that these people don't go, something's not right here. That's exactly it. So... Uh, the phone calls started at 2 o'clock local time, and they ended at 6 o'clock. Uh, six competitors. We all had 20 minutes and a 10-minute question and answer session. So my call was at 3. So I had a little bit of advantage over the later calls. Uh, but we all had national brands, of which I'm not going to say my uh, target, but we all had big companies that we were targeting. And it's a reasonable assumption that there will be somebody to answer the phone, but it, your, your mileage will vary. Uh, and fortunately for me, I came across an internal phone number when I was uh, digging through phone numbers that I had enumerated through open source intelligence. I was calling to verify they were live. And I came across one that was an Office 365 email migration hotline phone number. And that's what I used for my spoofing number. And I had six different pretexts, but I only used one of them because it worked. If I had have crashed and burned on that one, I would have just moved on to one of the other five. So you, there was uh, numbers being spoofed uh, to be able to get this? Well, the two phases. We have the OSINT phase. So once you're accepted and you accept to abide by the rules, uh, you have about three weeks to get as much intelligence to get the flags. There's about 35 of them. If you want to find out what the flags are, you can search for them. They're out on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, to get those flags, put together a report. Uh, with the report, you get points for the flags, and then you can get an additional 50 points for having a uh, professional report free of grammar and spelling issues. You get 50 more points, uh, up to 50 more points, uh, 10 points for each occurrence for realistic attack vectors. So if you have five realistic attack vectors, you can max that out. And that, I see that and the fact that you get 10 points from submitting a video, that's 110 free points. And you can max out at 218. So that really cuts it down. Um, so then once you submit the report, it goes out for grading. And then you have about three more weeks, which I calmed it down. I stopped trying to get the deep intelligence. But I'd still you know, spend a little bit of time calling the internal phone numbers I had and, and making sure they were live. Because uh, nobody wants to call a dead number, especially when you've got 20 minutes to do it. So then fast forward, we come here to Derby. Uh, or if it were the other one, DEF CON. 
Uh, you get put in the glass booth with a microphone and headphones. Uh, you give the team the numbers you want to call and where you want to spoof them from. Uh, you have 20 minutes and they make the calls. Uh, if someone answers, you go through your pretext, which you submit your pretext in your report. So there, there is an approval process for those. And there's certain rules, like you can't, you can't do anything illegal. You can't do anything destructive. You can't ask for things like passwords. You can't say you're law enforcement. You can't be threatening, anything like that. But anyway, I hit it lucky because on my, I think my third call, someone answered. And my pretext was I was in the IT security department and we were about to do an external audit. And I was verifying that the information was correct. And because of the intelligence I had gathered in the previous phase, I was able to put words in the target's mouth and get her to confirm or deny or correct me. Because, I mean, here's the thing. Humans have a desire to correct people. So if I tell you something and you say, yeah, that's right, or no, we use this, you're going to do it because of the human nature to correct. Um, so that works well with putting the words in the mouth. And then sometimes, um, you know, you just straight up ask. So you just have to kind of tiptoe around it. So I went through everything and uh, the one flag that you can get in person, you can't get in the OSINT phase, is getting to go to seorg.org. So in doing so, uh, I got the first target to go to it. She told me what was on the site. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's our security partner. Uh, it's running a system test. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Ended the call. Uh, I had like three people not answer, and then I got someone in IT. I asked him for the model number of his computer. He told me it was a Dell Latitude, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I kind of got a little nervous. Uh, I put BitLocker in his mouth, and he said, no, we don't use BitLocker. We use something else for encryption and antivirus. That's two different flags. And he didn't get suspicious until I asked him to go to the website. And at that point, the timer was at 1955. So uh, he asked me for some internal credentials to verify myself. I provided a bogus number. He, put, he said he was going to put me on hold to verify it, and I terminated the call. But something else I did that I didn't see anyone else do, and I don't think anybody had done to date, I took a keyboard and a mouse in there. No computer, just a keyboard and a mouse. And as I'm asking these questions and they're responding, I'm that cat in, in the GIF, just pecking away at the keyboard, not typing anything, just making the sound. And then I'm picking up the mouse, getting it right next to the microphone, clicking it so that it sounds like I'm realistically doing what I claim to be doing. That's fantastic. And it worked. It's just like at, at work, we had a target. And it was a financial institution. We were posing as a customer that had lo got locked out of their account. Well, I put a female on the phone to do the call. We had ran open source intelligence about the target. We knew he was a single dad. We knew he was having baby mama drama. So we put my colleague in air quotes, Walmart, with a crying baby. So literally, she's standing next to the speakers of my computer at work, spoofing a call to this guy. And we've got the sound of Walmart and a baby crying in the background. And every time this guy started getting on to us, I would just turn the volume of the baby crying up. And then I would stop it from time to time just you know, to make it be more realistic. And we almost got him, but he stuck to his guns and we gave him kudos in the report. By name, actually. The other person who fell victim, not by name, but by title, yes. So, um, so what kind of tools were you using to gather uh, OSINT? I know um, Mr. Beowulf, uh, 88, uh, you know, loves him some like plain old Google dorking. I mean, did you use anything like Maltigo or Recon NG? For the size of the organization I was after, a Maltigo free instance was pretty useless because you are allowed 12,000 data points. When you've got 6,000 employees, you're not going far. Um, I did use Recon NG. Recon NG has always been my go-to, it and Datasploit. Those have been my go-to. I'm all about them all day, every day. But I had to take Josh's approach. Google dorking got me so much more because once I got the target list and I had the people and I needed to build a profile on them, I had all that part down, like I was good on that, it was really solid. The hardest part for me was getting the people and finding the creative ways to find it besides just like HR, PR, the public facing ones. So um, um, one thing I did was I took the company name and then I found a, a PDF online of theirs and had their phone number syntax. And it was they you put the area code in parentheses and they had their prefix. They didn't own all 10,000 numbers, so I couldn't just do that search. So I had to do company name plus that string. Okay, well, that brought up everything on 
the web that had those two things. Well, there's PR everywhere. So I did a minus to take that extension off and I just kept refining it uh, to the point to where I ended up stumbling across where a former employee had sent emails to uh, a mailing list and hadn't removed a signature line. And because of that, I found out what they used for a storage and backup solution. I found out issues they had had. And then I found his GitHub, which further told me they were using Red Hat, Nagios, Apple, uh, Route 53 for Amazon DNS, as well as um, a few other technologies from his GitHub. So that right there, between that and the employee that posted a picture of his badge on Facebook publicly, I would consider those two were probably my two crown jewels. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, don't don't post your badges on Facebook. I've seen too many shows in Hollywood. They'll actually you know can print those out or recreate them from scratch. Absolutely. And and I mean even if you're having a picture made at work to be put up on the website, LinkedIn, anywhere like that, even if it's just the front, the back of the badge, right? So I saw a Target. I was looking at their pictures. They I saw the back of their badge. I didn't see what company it was. I found that from someone's resume on link on Indeed. But I saw the kind of stuff that was on it so that when I was on the phone, I could say, hey, move that orange paper from behind your badge and tell me what it says. So because I knew there was an orange paper, I must be internal. So, yeah, just be cautious. I mean, I know it looks authoritative to have that. You know, you're in your, your company button-up shirt. And you're, you're, you look high and mighty and there's a certain level of authority yeah but then i come along or someone not as nice someone that's really looking for ill will they come along and absolutely destroy you because of that so what are you going to do the rest of uh, DerbyCon? are you flying home tonight are you driving i am um going to the closing ceremony I'll say goodbye to my friends from afar, and then I am hopping in the car and boogieing back to Knoxville because I'm teaching next week. Uh, I'm going to be teaching an Alien Vault um, USM for Security Engineers course next week for work. So, Fantastic. Okay. So um, uh, people want to get a hold of you, discuss you know, SEO techniques, or maybe even talk about your podcast. How would they do that? Um, so you can reach me on Twitter at C underscore 3 p Joe. Uh, the domain uh, for the podcast is advancedpersistentsecurity.net, all one word. I'm never buying a domain that long again, I mm-hmm. promise. Uh, I'm even considering get, finding a way to shorten that one. Uh, the podcast is on Twitter at ADVPersistSec. Uh, it's everywhere you can find podcasts, um, Google, Apple, Stitcher, I believe YouTube. I, I know most of them. I know I've not published in like six or eight months, and I apologize for that, but I've got four episodes about to come out. I just got to get them edited, and I've not had the time. Um, but aside from that, um, if you want to email me, it's jgray at advancedpersistentsecurity.net. Uh, if you want to come out and see me, I'm going to be speaking at some cons. In fact, you know what, Brian? I'm going I'm to hook your guests up with something if this airs before uh, October 9th and 10th. It might just be that day. Hey, if it does, great. I've got you in mind, even if it does. Okay. So if you want to go to Hacker Halted in Atlanta, Georgia for free, October 9th and 10th, it's a Monday, Tuesday, use coupon code JGHH2017, you'll get in free. I'm actually keynoting day two. I'll be talking social engineering, open source intelligence, and lessons learned from the SECTF. Uh, In addition to that, I'll be speaking at um, Edge Security Conference in Knoxville, Tennessee, the 17th and 18th of October, uh, Skydog Con the following weekend in Nashville, then LASCON in Austin, Texas, uh, October 26th and 27th, uh, besides Charleston, November 11th, and there may be one in between it and the next one, but confirmed ISSA Atlanta, November 15th, and I'm done for the year. You are a very busy man, Joe. I hear there's these things called sleep and personal lives, and I'm yet to find either. But honestly, my hobby is security. If, if no one's ever noticed that from my previous appearances on your show or my own show or just meeting me out and about or following me on Twitter, I mean, it's my hobby, it's my passion, it's my career. So I have a good time coming out to cons, meeting people, talking about stuff. I mean, earlier today I was sitting out front and we were just shooting the breeze about stuff and this guy was like, yeah, I learned all these things in this class. I was like, have you ever used a canary? No, 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 we can't afford one. What if I told you about a free one? Uh, I'll share this too. You want to do a free canary? Let's do it. So your um, Windows uh, administrator account, user number 500, right? Right. Everybody says, rename it and disable it. No, don't. 
Neither. Set the logon hours to zero and a six character password. It will never be able to log on. And the second you see it log on, that means that Mimi Cats has been ran somewhere else and that password is compromised. That is fantastic. And it costs you nothing. Wow, that's, that is really awesome. I look forward to uh, telling our IT people about that. So, Joe, thank you for uh, coming on the show. Hey, Appreciate that. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. You know, uh, I like to listen to other podcasts, and you know, yours is definitely probably my absolute favorite. Um, you know, I, I like them all, of course. Um, but, you know, there, there's just something about your show. It's like I could hang out with these people, and, it, and it's kind of ironic because this weekend I did. Exactly. All right. So, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys missed out on the pizza party. I even broke my diet to eat, like, pizza, and it was delicious. So, was hey, I'm sorry we broke your diet for you, so, but. And you didn't hold me down to put the food in my mouth. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe, again, for and congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Right. And thanks for having me. You know, we got to do something together in the future, man. Absolutely. So.